QSLing is uh, something I really enjoy, and I'm hoping that you will get the bug as well. Uh, hopefully most of you know what a QSL card is. When I started in, in this uh, radio hobby, I started out as a shortwave listener. In the old days where there used to be uh, the BBC World Service and Radio Canada International and Radio South Africa and Radio Deutsche Welle in Germany and so on. And I was uh, 12, 13, 14 years old and writing away for QSL cards like this one from Radio Sweden. Um, but ham operators also have their own QSL cards. And uh, so I'll be talking about why, uh, why you should think about it and some of the different ways we can QSL nowadays. So there's my card. Um, everybody basically should have their own and be original or whatever. I've used this design I, I came up with years ago uh, just to show something about where we are. Here's Canada in the left corner top left corner, there's Calgary and kind of a picture of Calgary at night and um, my address. So that's that's my card. And then I have a back of the card, which I'll talk about. Uh, but basically uh, there's a philosophy that it's the final courtesy of a contact, that it's the way to complete a contact formally, if you wish to do so. A lot of people are not into it, but I think it's nice to have a collection anyway. So here's, here's all the reasons I could come up with to QSL. If you're gonna confirm important contacts. Now, there are um, special events that are going on all the time. If you've listened on the radio for a while, there, there's um, the Edmund Fitzgerald uh, Memorial is on the air every year. There's uh, sporting events, the World Cup. Uh, I remember years ago it was in Germany and they, Every city in Germany had their own QSL card for their own station on the air and so on. So you can collect them. So it's fun to collect all these different special event cards. DXing, of course, for awards, uh, collecting foreign stamps, um, display in your shack, come up with an album. I have an album where I put one card from every country. So I've got, uh, let's see if I can hold this up here. It's a, it's a binder full of, so I've got uh, basically yay thick and I'm missing, I don't know, about 20 countries. Some I've sent cards to and my money's been stolen in the mail and never got back. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and if you decide to get QSL cards, if you don't have any, the question is how many should you get? and hopefully we'll uh, answer that too. So there's all kinds of certificates and awards you can get. Um, and so designing a card, if you're into designing a card, typical size is like a postcard, three and a half inches by five and a half inches or the metric equivalent. And if you're handy with uh, PowerPoint or other graphic software, you can come up with all kinds of amazing designs all by yourself. And if you have a good printer, you can print your own cards and you don't need to have somebody else print them for you. But you can save money um, by having some of these other guys print them, I believe, or maybe not. Um, and one thing I'll point out is they should be done tastefully. There are some cards that are a little um, um, not politically correct, sh should I say. I won't be showing any of those. But uh, consider that you may be sending these to foreign locations that might find them uh, distasteful as well. So uh, it's not usually a big problem for most people. And uh, on the back, what you should put on there, obviously your call sign, this little slash M slash P, if you tend to go mobile or portable, you can have a little checkbox if you were portable for that day. Um, your card, uh, uh, your address, if you want to put your CQ zone, remember we talked about zone, uh, ITU zone, grid square, county. A lot of people are county collectors in, in the US. So knowing what county is, is important. And then you can, uh, one of the things people don't realize, you can use these for multiple contacts. If you work that the expedition on three bands, then they will probably put a sticker. They print them out on a computer uh, printer 
and just paste it over top of this. And if you want a, a card in, in exchange for yours, you should tick this box, please QSL, uh, and, and circle which method you want and then sign it. Or if you're replying to somebody, a card that it's already sent you, you can just say, tick the box, thanks. And they, they will know not, not to send you another one. They may not have a great database that keeps track of the ones they've sent. Most people do, and the logging software does. So an idea of typical costs, I use this guy UX5UO and they're about $98 Canadian for a thousand cards. And they're really nice cards all the way up to 129 for special uh, glossy two-sided whatever. I think I did the $109, but when I ordered them, they were probably about $80 for the thousand that I got. And I've, I've gone through, I think in 15 years, I've gone through about 1500 cards. Um, here's, I found this one online, QSL Concept Canada, $89 for a thousand cards. And they'll print as few as a hundred for 49 bucks. So pretty good deal. Uh, when I first uh, uh, moved back to Canada from the States in, in uh, 1999, I went to a printing shop in Bow Valley Square while I was working. They wanted a dollar a card, thousand dollars for a thousand cards. And uh, I said, <laughs> there's gotta be a better way. So there are. Um, this guy, my first QSL card when I was a VE3, um, when I was 16 in Ontario, uh, Wayne Carroll printed my first cards. He just passed away uh, last year or two years ago, I guess now. And you'll recognize this style. I just put, I wanted to put it on there because it's a classic style you'll still see so many places. And this guy, it's called Cheap QSL Cards. Uh, so you can Google that and 10 bucks for 100 cards in the US. They're one-sided, there's nothing on the back. So some do's and don'ts. I have a, an example here. This is what I do. Um, I take, so if I want a card from uh, an American or a US, I take my card and I take uh, two US dollar bills and I fold them in half and I stick it like that. And then I take my envelope with my self-addressed envelope. I just took a blank one here, but I would have my address already on there. Stick that in there to hide the dollar bills. And then I stick that inside another envelope so that it's all stuck in there and you can't see through it. And I never put the guy's call sign on the outside. That's a tip off right away because people are looking for that and they'll look for the, the dollar bills inside. And if it's uh, Europe, it's fine. <clears throat> if it's Africa or India, uh, Pakistan, sort of the Asian region, um, less fine. Some are good, but I, I, I've had about a 50% success rate outside of Europe. Um, don't send like, here dollar bills to foreign stations unless you're willing to gamble those dollar bills. But when I was trying to get my DXCC and I was sending out all these cards, I would go to the bank, I call them up. I said, I need to order a hundred US dollar bills, $1 bills. And they'll say, come in Thursday, we'll have them for you. And so that's what I would do. There's also another thing called a international reply coupon. Looks like this. And uh, it's written in about a dozen languages on the back. Uh, these, I think, have been discontinued, but I still get them. This one comes from Japan. And you're supposed to be able to cash this in for a first-class uh, first postage in your own country. So you can exchange these with other countries, I believe, still. One thing you should do is check with qrz.com. I'm sure everybody knows about qrz.com. Um, you should put all your information on there. Look at the bottom, do they QSL by mail? EQSL we'll talk about and LOTW we'll talk about. So I, I will take anything. I'm not choosy in that regard. Uh, here's an example. This, this is a big contest station in Italy. And if you want their card, it tells you, should you want to receive a direct QSL from us, please include, and you look down here, $2 for Europe, $3 outside of Europe, plus a self-addressed envelope. So that's how you, you'll find out what to do. 
Now, the next thing is uh, the QSL Bureau. It's the cheapest but the slowest way to exchange paper cards. Sometimes you can wait 10 years or more to get a card. So we have to be patient in this hobby. Most countries have a bureau. So we have the RAC, the Radio Amateurs of Canada has a bureau and I am the bureau manager for Alberta. So if you get cards through the bureau, they'll be coming through me now. I started that in December, took over from the guys that last did it for 15 years and they, they were tired. Um, so what happens is um, if, if I wanted, for example, to send a card to a station in Europe, the current rate for even a postcard now is $2.71 Canadian to send them a card or a letter up to 30 grams. So if I wanted to send 10 cards out, that's 27 bucks, uh, not gonna happen. So what I could do is I could take those 10 cards and send them to the outgoing bureau at the rack in Ottawa. And they, they have a, a big um, facility where they take all these cards and when they get enough of them to any particular country, they mail them out in a bulk mailing. So uh, they may send out four or 500 cards to Germany, another four or 500 cards to France and so on. That way you save postage because it only cost me $5.47 to go up to 400, gram, uh, 400 to 500 grams within Canada. So I, I figured out the cards weigh about three grams each. So I can ship 150 cards for $5.47 to the Bureau and they'll send them out to me or to the, to the other countries. Make sure you sort the cards. You have the call sign at the top of each QSL card in big letters and sort it alphabetically to make it easier for the sorters to put them into the slots. So, and uh, there's the address if you wanna read about it. For the incoming bureau, uh, most provinces have their own, but some share duties. Uh, this is where you can look and it gives you more more of an explanation of what we do. I have a, a sorting bin over here. I have uh, the last shipment I sent out was in uh, late December after Christmas. I haven't received any more cards from the Ottawa Bureau, uh, but I expect uh, three or four times a year to get a shipment and then I'll be sending it out to you. And typically you put about $5 in to cover my costs of shipping uh, postage and, and envelopes. And if it runs low, I let you know. And so that's a way of getting cards. Amir has a pile of cards that uh, he said he'll come and pick up. If that was late December. Uh, he'll get around to it one of these days. And if you move, you should let the um, ISED know right away. You're, in fact, you're legally supposed to within 30 days. Electronic USLs have become a lot more popular because they don't cost so much and they're quick, as fast as you can uh, upload your, your log. Note that um, the ADI format, uh, amateur data interchange format is the common currency. So if you have a, a logging program, you can always export your log in, in those and then use uh, other third party programs to, uh, to generate computer labels if you want. Logbook of the World is the ARL's official thing. You don't have to actually be a member to join, but you uh, have to register and obtain their call sign certificate and you'll get a Logbook of the World account. And then you can submit your contacts through, um, through that ADI format and they will keep track of them for you. And, and if you want an award or certificate, then you have to pay the money, the 12 cents per contact. And this is what it looks like on there. You can look at your DXCC account or your Worked All States account and it'll tell you on which bands and which modes and so on you qualify. When you qualify, you can then pay your money and get your awards. And if they award it, then they have a little asterisk beside it. So you pay all that money for an asterisk. <laughs> uh, EQSL is sort of a rival. This was started, I think, by... Uh, uh, CQ Magazine, uh, and so they have a lot of the same awards. 
Uh, instead of DXCC, they call it EDX100. Um, and instead of work to all states, they call it EWAS and so on. So, and, and it's, um, you get, a, um, you have to send them some information to be uh, authenticity guaranteed. So it's, you're, you're uh, checked out to make sure you're legit. And then club log is another thing that uh, it, it's a uh, online database that supports DXers. But the main thing I use it for is what's called the OQRS. You can't use OQRS unless you sign up to club log. It's free. But what OQRS is, is saves you all those dollar bills in the mail. If you talk to an exotic DX station, you want their QSL card, chances are they're a member of club log. So what you do is you go on, on OQRS and you say, okay, I, I worked uh, B7S. You type that in and it says, okay, and what is your call sign? And it says, uh, type in the, the information. They want your date and time and all that stuff. You type that in and if it matches their log, which they've uploaded, then it says you've got two options. You can either uh, ask for a bureau card, in which case it's free and you might wait a few years or you can pay the uh, three pounds 50 uh, British money or four dollars US or whatever they ask for. And that way you don't have to send money in the mail or your QSL card and it comes usually within a couple weeks. So this is a, uh, a relatively new service and uh, normally pay by PayPal and it's, uh, it works very well. Now you can get these exotic cards because I figure by the time you order, all, you know, you paid for your QSL card that you've designed, the envelope, the stamp, um, and so on, it's about five bucks you're invested already. And then there's certificates and awards that you can get. If you're into FT8, I strongly recommend getting a, a membership. They, they're free, the Digital Modes Club and the 30 meter digital group. Uh, you get all kinds of amazing uh, looking certificates to download and then you can either print them out or uh, I don't know, look at them for a while. But anyway, there's there um, lots of, for example, uh, I worked uh, uh, 10 Romanian stations. So there's an award for that. Who knew? Uh, you just upload your log and it tells you how all these different things you qualify for. Worked 50 Russian prefixes. Uh, and a hundred Russian stations and uh, five Taiwanese prefixes. So all kinds of <laughs> hundred beers club. Yes, uh, thank you, George. I bet there there is one. If not, you can design one and they'll they'll figure it out. So yeah, there's lots of certificates and whatever. There's a, a qrz.com actually where we keep our information has its own certificates and whatever you can look at. And I found out that I qualified for Master of Radio Communications Asia. So I've got uh, seven certificates in that. And I had no idea, but since uh, I uploaded my log in there, they tell me. And so that's uh, some references. Um, I tried to get in the Digital Modes Club, but they say they're temporarily out of business. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, probably a political struggle because it goes across several European countries. But... Uh, no, there's a lot of a lot of uh, interest in that as well. So that's the QSL part. I've now got a, about 15 minutes or so. Uh, if there are any questions, or we can talk about anything uh, people want to talk about. Do you upload your logs to just one of these services or to many of them? Good question, Pat. I upload to uh, LOTW, EQSL, and um, QRZ, yes, QRZ, uh, I do because they keep track of your, and they post on my, my page the uh, 10 most recent contacts. And there's another one called QRZCQ. They keep bo bothering me about it, so I, uh, I upload to them. One of the nice things about having LOTW or EQSL to upload to is if something happens to your log, your computer dies or your hard drive dies or something and you don't have a backup, you can always download it from there again. 
Any more questions? QSLing, HF radio. Yes, yeah, so then the uh, question is about the IRC. <clears throat> is there any IRC by Canada Postal or it doesn't exist any longer? I was reading a couple of years ago that they were discontinuing it. So I don't think you can buy them anymore. It was one of the worst deals I've ever seen actually because to buy an IRC at the time, this is probably five years ago, cost $3.25, which was supposed to be equivalent to first class postage for anyone else re replying to you around the world. And yet when I tried to cash in an IRC, they would only give me 70 cents. So I thought I, I, I'm never gonna do this and I never have, but I've received a lot of them primarily from Japan It's very popular. But they have, they have them from different countries. All right, do we have any more? Can, can I just ask uh, just an HF question? Sure. A technical question, I guess. Um, so uh, I've, been, I've been doing some, uh, some FT8 and I use like an ICOM 7300. And um, it's, it's when, I, when I transmit, I get really low SWR, uh, say on 20 meters, it's like, you know, 1.2 or something like that. And, um, and I'll get as, as much as uh, like 19 amps. Uh, showing up on my 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 uh, power source. Um, when I switch to you know still on twenty meters, if I do single sideband and phone, I notice it's um, my my SWR just kind of jumps all over the place. Sometimes it gets up to like three or something like that, and um, and I only seem to be able to to put out like according to my power meter like I don't know it goes anywhere from like you know five to say nine amps or something like that. Is that just I don't know. Am I, maybe I'm doing something wrong, or is it just a feature of, of single sideband that it's it's just way less efficient? Or no, not necessarily. It sounds to me like uh, the rig is protecting itself. It because the SWR has gone up. Yeah. It's saying I can't put out so much power because so much is being reflected and going to heat up the finals. So it's it's limiting the current uh, and the power that it's putting out because it has a mismatch. Now, that has a built-in tuner, but I believe it's a very, um, not a very wide range of SWRs that it supports. Yeah, uh, I got an external tuner. Okay. Uh, gosh, I can't remember what it's called, but uh, yeah, I've got, I've got an external tuner. So um, you have you switched off the internal tuner to use the external one? Oh, good question. Um, because if you don't do that, they'll fight with each other and they'll Maybe try that's to it. Yeah. Okay. make sure you turn that off and okay, then I'll make sure that's... and use the external one because it probably has a better uh, range of SWRs it can handle, it can match. Yeah. One thing to watch for too is your ALC. If your mic gain is too low, you won't actually be transmitting at full power, <clears throat> which would in theory kind of make it look like your SWR is better with FT8 when in fact it isn't because you're not actually transmitting full power. Yeah, and on that, so I, I, I took a little picture of my rig and the ALC seems to be still in, like it's not in the red zone, it's down below, uh, you know, whatever. Um, so it doesn't appear to me that it's an ALC issue. And it's funny because I still, I make contacts uh, in the states and so forth, um, but I I was just it, it, uh, I just didn't know it was, it's just so I get such great range on FTA. I mean I got you know Russia and Japan and Indonesia and all over the place, but uh, and some Europe too. But then uh, when I switch to voice, it just it seems to be you know I guess that's it. Maybe the radio is protecting itself, and I have to see if there's a a problem with the tuners. Anyways, thank you. That I'll I'll, I'll play with it some more. No, I think Amir raises a very good point that uh, unless you have the right uh, gain setting for your microphone as well, it will not be it will not be uh, putting out the full power. Um, it also has um, speech processing. So uh, I don't know if you've turned the speech processing on and off, but that tends to uh, boost the audio levels to to uh, maximize that. Oh, okay. Oh, I'll look. I'll look for that as well then. You might want to um, 
try experimenting with a local ham to have uh, have him or her listen to your audio and see how that sounds um, just to make sure that it's it's coming out properly. Yeah, it's funny. So th this past, well, this weekend or the weekend before, I can't recall, but I mean, I made a number of contacts, um, single sideband uh, uh, um, on different, on different uh, frequencies. And I got five nines back. They said, you know, sound quality is good and et cetera. So. Yeah. Mo the more I'm thinking about it, the more I think your, your two um, antenna tuners are fighting with each other, which is why you're seeing that SWR going back and forth. Okay. Okay. And for some reason, FT8 wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Well, FT8 is more of a, a consistent signal. Okay. It's just like a, a tone. So it probably wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Or your SWR is already matching pretty well. So they don't have to fight with each other. Okay. Well, thanks. I'll take a look. It's, been, it's just been frustrating because on FT8, it's, it's given the full 100, uh, 100 watts and working like a charm. And then I go to do phone and it just, it seems to clog up, but thank you. Jeff, one thing um, I do is I, I have a DX3000 and I don't use the internal tuner in it. I have an external Versa tuner, which I can super finely match uh, the, the antenna that I'm using. But one thing I do is I tune it up on FM at five watts, 10 watts, 30 watts. And I watch to make sure my SWR is, is, is a perfect match. And then before I go back into sideband, uh, if I can get, you know, 30 watts FM flawless, uh, it'll yeah. work 100 watts sideband without even oh. an issue. Yeah, because that's the odd thing. The, the, the tuner I'm using, I think it's an LDG. Mm -hmm. um, but when I, uh, like, when I tune up, and I typically do before I, before I transmit, um, it's, it's, you know, I'm getting the green light, like it's, it's tuned and, and SWR is, is next to nothing. It's only when I, um, you know, activate my mic and start to talk. The other thing you can try, do you have a dummy load? No, I usually, I usually go and try and find a, you know, a place where nobody's talking and then I tune up on that and then I scroll back to where I was. Well, this is a good reason to get one so that you can eliminate the antenna from the equation. If you have a perfect 50 ohm match and then you can put your radio on sideband and tune up and see what you're actually putting out that's a great idea yeah maybe i'll pick one up at uh at uh gps central this weekend there's yeah. a 30 watt max say it again sorry uh the, the one they have the diamond is only a 30 watt maximum oh that's all they got oh okay continuous yeah there's an mfj 300 sitting on the shelf is there one there oh I have one of those and they work very well. Vince, if you put a post-it note on it, I'll come get it. <laughs> um, I'll have to tell Greg or somebody to do that, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. Anyways, By the way, Vince, I, I uh, did order that uh, plate for my rotator and uh, they saved me a lot of money. Oh, good. Good, good. Um, I'm thinking, uh, I, I, sorry, I had to drop off for a bit and I, sorry, I've missed a little bit of this, the symptomology, what Jeff was describing, but generally if things are working in one mode, but not another, it also could be a sign of RF in the shack or RF feedback. And that's commonly seen coming into a microphone. It's not unusual that your power isn't 100 watts on sideband, by the way, um, because your, average, your voice doesn't maintain a high level of sound 100% of the time, and it takes time for the power to get up there. Jerry's comments on processor usage and, um, and I'll add equalization uh, has a lot to do with that power envelope too. Um, the way my system is configured, I get about 50 watts out uh, average on uh, sideband uh, as I'm in the middle of talking kind of continuously. Um, and then if I heard you say you're running FT8 at 100 watts and you're getting 100 watts out, uh, keep in mind the radios are rated for intermittent duty at those kind of power levels. Um, and FT8 is a continuous power, power duty cycle for 15 seconds. So uh, I generally recommend that you don't run those power levels for a long period of time, like at all. I run 
I run 10 watts on my radio. Which and if somebody can't hear me, it. yeah, if, if somebody can't hear me on digital mode at 10 watts, I don't work them. Some guys run 35 or 40. You know, it depends on your level of risk. Mine is very low. Okay. Yeah, I guess I just didn't know any better. That's yeah. I, no, that's all good. Yep. But uh, but it but you know, I like again, I, I do seem to get some really, some really great distance, and I think I stumbled oh, into yeah. the, the magic area gray zone, uh, Jerry, just unknowingly a couple of times. That was the 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 the, the couple of mornings where I seemed to suddenly just be all over Europe, uh, working working France and Italy, which normally I don't I don't stand a chance. Uh, so what band is this on? Is that tw twenty meters? 20 yeah yeah uh for sure if it's uh in the morning uh, again the gray line can be uh about two hours wide uh, an hour before sunrise to an hour after sunrise or sunset but um sometimes a little longer i've seen it as long as two hours uh either way so uh yeah, keep that in mind. And that's one of the advantages of why I suggested people listen. Just uh, set aside uh, some time, a few hours here and there a week, just to listen and notice what you're hearing um, from where, like which bands are alive, which ones are dead, which ones are giving you DX, which ones aren't. And you'll start to see a pattern over time. And things flip around with the seasons. Um, you'll see... Um, for example, in the winter, we'll be working Europe in the morning, but in the summer, we'll be working it in the evening. And, um, you know, like in the, in the middle of uh, summer, at night, you'll be working Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and no other time of year. So the, it's all very uh, cyclical, and uh, it, it's just... Um, the listening part of it will will fill you in, even if you don't know the why of it, you'll know when. One of those things I do to, I run a personal propagation thing here at my station. And I do that by leaving a radio on FT8 through my sound card. And I report packets to PSK Reporter. Earlier you saw I posted a link in about PSK Reporter and all the spots heard on all bands uh, from grid square DO30. So there's DO20, DO30, DO21, DO31 are in the Calgary area. I'm in DO30. And for me, I can look at that and see who's hearing what that's taking some time to post their packets to the internet for the benefit of the rest of us. You can do this yourself by setting up your radio and then watching, setting up a tab on PSK report and you can say show all spots heard by station VE6LK on mode FT8 on this band in the last 15 minutes. I pick FT8 because it's one of the busiest digital modes. You can do this with any of the digital modes, but FT8 works best because there's some reporting aspect involved in it. And then you can see what's going on. So Nehru trying to figure out when the gray zones are and the gray lines are. And at this time of year, it changes rapidly because we're gaining daylight rapidly around summer solstice and winter solstice when it changes very slowly you don't you can get it fairly accurate by doing this method but track it for two or three days and then know then you know when to get up early and there's you can another, you can track it over 24 hours and you can see when people are doing what's that jerry sorry uh there's another way too what i've done in this uh ipad or the app uh idx you can filter by um, the spot, who, who spotted it. So I put a filter mm -hmm. of VE6 and I can see all the VE6 spots for the last however long I wanna look at. And I can spot it, uh, look at it by band and I can see, okay, 20 meters VE6 mm -hmm. spots. Um, and then I can see what time they're working which countries over the last week or two weeks. And I can see what's been going on and, and figure it out that way. Brilliant. So, and that's, that's a free app. We are approaching nine o'clock. Um, been a very good discussion. I'm hoping that, that people are more enthusiastic or the more they know about DXing and, and uh, HF, the more they wanna try it. I know the majority of people get into ham radio these days because of other things than HF. 
but uh, hopefully once they're, they're involved in the hobby, they can see the value of this and the fun. And I still think uh, if um, you get into the CW mood and start trying that out and start making contacts in, in foreign countries on CW, you're gonna just find a whole new level of enjoyment. And Andre will uh, either confirm or tell me I'm crazy. Wouldn't be the first. Uh, give me another 10 weeks, uh, Jerry. The training is starting in uh, two weeks from today, so. Excellent, and, and I won't hold you to that. You can answer a year or two from now. I'm very patient. <laughs> but I've known people locally um, uh, that have recently learned CW and have been on the air and have just had a lot of fun with it. 